First, uh, I must thank Ajay uh, for putting this volume together. I'll build on where Ashish that left partly, uh, but I will need to come to that, uh, building on a few questions that the book raises uh, for us uh, to ponder upon, to think. Um, and I'll take off from uh, the way Ajay sets up uh, the premise of the book. Uh, it comes uh, like this, the relevance of political violence or more specifically revolutionary violence and its efficacy in forging radical social political change. So uh, the book tries to understand what is the relationship between revolutionary violence and what is revolutionary violence of course needs to be discussed including what is revolution, uh, the, what will pass off as revolution and then its relationship to change or transformation. So in that sense the book explores um, this troubled connection, this hyphen, the, the stapling of revolutionary violence and social or political transformation and, and, and how long, uh, how far does it hold. It of course uh, has to then deal with uh, two sides uh, of the problem, um, one the relationship between revolution and violence. So, so uh, as soon as the book tries to connect revolutionary violence and social transformation, it has to first deal of course with revolution and violence and that would make us ask the question what is revolutionary about violence? When does violence become revolutionary and when is it not? Including, I think the question can be asked the other way around also, when is revolution violent? Or are all framings and philosophies of revolution violent? Does uh, revolution require a subtext of violence because it's tied to a disjunctive break? It has, to, it has to produce a break with the situation, uh, with the status quo, with the inertia of rest, uh, uh, a premise uh, or a ground is in. So, so in some sense, uh, this is a question that, that the book actually manages to ask very, very well actually. Uh, min, actually, number of chapters in the book uh, tackle this question, tackle this question head on actually. Uh, in that sense, uh, and I've said this to Ajay already, it's a, it's a valuable work. I don't want to say interesting and all that. Uh, it's a valuable work. It's a necessary work. It's a work that will make us ponder upon um, how we have left uh, a, a number of um, domains uh, unexamined sometimes. And uh, the book manages to open those domains. One you have opened. What is revenue? And, 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 and the, the, the modern idea of revolution, how, how revolution is tied uh, to the French Revolution or, or, is there a, or is there a paradigmatic model of revolution, a paradigmatic model that inserts itself into the apparently seamless continuity of history to produce what Ashisda is calling the disjunctive break um, and then there would be a lot of debate as to whether there was a break was it a break, break enough? Was it a good enough break? And I remember, even from my student days, the endless debates we were in, whether the Soviet revolution was a revolution. Was it a break enough? And, and we would go on, go on debating that. Um, uh, it would also, and, and the book takes us thereafter uh, uh, 
to, to another question, uh, do the revolutionariness and the reactionariness of violence depend on who institutes violence? So, so how will we decide this is revolutionary violence and this is reactionary violence? Including uh, the question, um, uh, what will uh, determine uh, which violence is revolutionary? Uh, is, it, is it the one instituting it? Or is it the name? In whose name is it instituted that will determine uh, the whole question of the revolutionariness of violence? And that takes the book, a number of chapters in the book, especially the last two, I would say, to a very interesting uh, question, Ajay also raises in the introduction, um, where is the Adivasi or the Dalit, or sometimes the book says subaltern, in the revolution? What is, what, is the, what is the location, where is the subaltern, in whose name the revolution is instituted? What is the relationship between the vanguard organization and the subaltern, in whose name it is acting? And, and uh, the book, book manages to explore this question uh, very well, I would say. I'll come to that in the last two chapters. Um, including will ends determine the adjective revolutionary or reactionary uh, that shall uh, stick to means? So uh, uh, the question of means and ends. Uh, the other question the book tackles very well, I think, is reactive violence, violence in reaction to state terror, simply because it is reactive, it is revolution. And, and there are many arguments that come in the book that this is violence in response. It's, it's not originary violence. It is the violence of somebody who had no other option but to be violent. So, so, uh, uh, and and uh, then do we need to think violence only in terms of reaction, of, 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 and, and that needs to be thought. Um, can we have then um, a reflection, and this is where the book takes us, a reflection on one revolution, two violence, but then the stapled terms revolutionary violence. That, that how do you staple these two terms? How do they come together? and then uh, make a case for violence or for revolution. And here we are in a little bit of a trouble. Uh, through revolutionary violence, will we make a case for revolution or will we make a case for violence? Would, we, would it be a justification for violence because it's revolutionary um, or, or would it be, a, would it be a, a, an instantiation, oh, this is revolutionary. Uh, so uh, that, is, that is another problem in the book book tackles. Uh, in, in that sense, what then uh, uh, one needs to ponder upon or reflect upon is how does um, one uh, revisit the question of revolutionary violence, including the question of revolution. How does, how does one visit that? And here um, I thought um, uh, the book uh, uh, makes, uh, and I'll come to those, a few lines I want to quote uh, from Ajay's introduction. Um, uh, what is the relationship between violence and social transformation, uh, whatever its costs? So uh, a point uh, Ajay raises in the introduction, uh, the question of cost, is the cost balancing the gains? Uh, is the cost of violence uh, 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 high and uh, too high uh, for the gains uh, that are that are that are achieved or arrived at, uh, and this is actually the chapter uh, uh, in the book uh, uh, which uh, is is important actually. Um, uh, the Janatana Sarkar uh, an alternative model of development. Uh, by Varavara Rao, uh, where he tries to actually enumerate, enlist the gains. And the gains, actually that's interesting actually, when uh, he writes, he doesn't present the gains 
just as revolution. He presents the gains as a triad, class struggle, alternative models of development, and some work on social esteem is a, uh, is a, is a, is a term that keeps recurring uh, in one of the chapters at the end, uh, uh, written by Chitralekha. Uh, where the question of if that comes. So the question is not that the gains are not presented as, as revolution, as, as not a, well it's not a, it's not a transition of society, that it's, the society has simply transited from feudalism to capitalism to something else. Um, uh, but the gains are presented in terms of a triad, and the triad is a very complex triad actually. Uh, part of the gains are presented as alternative models of development, including alternative ways of agriculture, agriculture uh, without fertilizer sometimes, alternative ways of approaching questions of health, alternative ways of approaching questions of Adivasi culture, etc, etc. So the gains are also not presented uh, by one of the leading proponents actually uh, in terms of revolution, very really interesting, or uh, in terms of that disjunctive break uh, that, that revolution uh, uh, professes. It also takes me uh, to the chapter uh, by uh, Tel Tunde, uh, which is a, which is a really uh, uh, interesting take, and I and I try to make this connection in the book. Uh, the book is the book is the architecture of the book is interesting, actually, in that sense. The 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 uh, the few chapters um, at the beginning of the book, especially uh, Anand's chapter, uh, actually tries to ask. Uh, what is there in Marxism, or in the history of Marxism, or in Marx, Engels, and Lenin's writings um, that has a kind of a justification for violence, which would, which would come as an inalienable connection uh, with revolution, with that kind of uh, what I would call big bang social or political transformation the Big Bang transformation, uh, uh, it would come with violence and the, and the number of uh, metaphors uh, that keep coming as, as, as this discussion goes on, the justification of violence tied to structural violence. Violence is not exalted, but a structural necessity given the nature of the state capital interface which creates uh, what he refers to as structural violence. So this is, this is how the chapter sets it up. Uh, as also, I would argue with, with him, uh, Marxist theories of transition, Big Bang, and the repeated invocation of the, of, the, of the term overthrow. Something will have to be overthrown. And, 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 and uh, uh, that uh, sort of uh, works as, as the kind of coded justification of violence, and then the metaphor uh, that repeatedly occurs in Marx, labor banks, birth banks, that, 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 that it, is, it is bound to be painful uh, and, and, and that in a way uh, justifies. Uh, Anu's chapter actually goes into the detail. Uh, I myself have looked into uh, uh, much of uh, Marx and Engels's and then Lenin's writings, especially writings on the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, uh, it, it looks to be uh, a later Marxist invocation uh, largely uh, uh, than Marx. Uh, so, so, so in that sense, um, uh, uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a point we can discuss and I want Ajay also to respond to this. Um, I, was, I was wanting to think, um, uh, and that is the other pole of the book, democracy. Uh, and when I come to that, I'll invoke it actually. Uh, 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 can uh, what is the relationship between democracy and revolution? So one is the relationship between revolution and violence. The other is the uh, relationship between democracy and revolution. And uh, that takes us to the question: Will revolutions have to be thought uh, through the metaphor of uh, labor pain or birth pangs? Uh, and this understanding of transition, I would argue. And this is one angle maybe that the book could have developed a little more, um, uh, uh, that this understanding of transition of societies, it's a question. Is it in turn tied 
to how one understands capitalism and state. Hard, rock solid, homogeneous, closed, such that it has to be overthrown in one grand overhaul, producing the disjunctive grip. Does our description of reality, capitalism, state, etc., etc., give us an understanding of transition, which is also Big Bang? Because there is no other way you can think of the transition, because reality is rock solid. So you have to break it down in one big crumble. So hence the entire discussion on crisis of capitalism, that someday it's going to come down uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, auto crisis imbued in it uh, and it's going to come crumbling down. So, so is it tied to also how we understand social reality, we understand capitalism, we understand state, etc, etc. And there I would say the last two chapters do very well actually to disaggregate, uh, decenter, I don't want to quickly say deconstruct, uh, the idea uh, or the, the understanding of reality in Jharkhand. They, they both look at Jharkhand uh, and, it's a, and it's a really close look at reality in Jharkhand where, where uh, at least three entities are at work. Uh, the Indian state with its many arms and ramifications, complex, contradictory, uh, 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 the, the Maoist uh, left organizations, the Adivasi, the subaltern, and some Dalit uh, 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 subjects. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there are uh, what we would call right-wing organizations also working on education, on, on relief sometimes. So all of these are working together, some working during daytime, some working after sunset. Uh, and and the, and the subaltern uh, works uh, through a kind of very complex, contradictory, and contingent negotiation among these many entities that are operating over here. So, so it's not not a simple state versus Maoist state versus tribals. It's it's simply not that. And and uh, 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 a relook at reality may have uh, may offer a relook at what we have made of revolution. So, so this is this is one. Uh, uh, Ajayin's introduction raises the question of cost uh, quite well. Uh, if the costs of using violence actually match up to the gains uh, it brings for the social groups in whose name it is being deployed, um, or or uh, it merely ends up quote unquote uh, a, 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 a term uh, that has been really worked upon in the volume using the subaltern social groups as entities in whose name one operates. And, and, the, and the book really manages to work its way through using or deploying. Uh, it really manages to do that very well, I must say. Um, uh, and, and in that sense, uh, I, I thought, Ajay, you raised this question, and maybe Anand's chapter could have explored this question uh, a little more, uh, when you say that, that the that the, that, the, that the nature of the changes under the neoliberal economic order, which is sometimes faceless and, and dispersed, uh, unlike the previous feudal regimes or national governments that were authoritarian in nature, it becomes pertinent to ask who exactly are the targets of this kind of violence and what does it yield? And, and, and you have a very charged line, uh, definitive targets get replaced by series of networks. So how do you how do you how do you find uh, who to target who to uh, uh, so this is this is one side of the book the other uh, uh, interesting side of the book uh, is revolutionary violence versus democracy so uh, in that sense uh, the book explores the verses uh, very well. I think that 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 uh, uh, what is the relationship between these two? When we say it's verses, uh, it looks like they are on two sides. You you can either have revolutionary violence, or on the other side there is democracy. And and this takes me actually um, to uh, 
two angles the book opens up, I'm building on them actually because it has made me think. Um, one, as Ashista was trying to do, uh, can the pole of revolution and revolutionary violence be problematized? On the other hand, can the pole of democracy be problematized? Rather than be celebratory about it or a radical denouncement of it. And I see a clue in Marx's civil war in France uh, where he tries to think what is the relationship between revolution and democracy? Can we think of the relationship and not have a simple versus? And I know it looks, given our experience, it looks the versus. And uh, I felt a number of chapters, uh, including Professor Chandogya's chapter, but I don't want to invoke too much of her chapter. She's here, uh, 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 actually problematizes the notion of and, and that uh, is also a contribution of the book, uh, which manages to open up the term democracy. Uh, what is it? Rather than simply saying it's great or it's sham. Uh, uh, and, and the last two chapters, again, I'm having to go back to those two, uh, because they're kind of stories from the ground experiences from the ground. And in that sense, uh, what, I was, what I was suggesting about the architecture of the book, the book is divided into three parts. Um, interconnected, but they are interesting, interesting partitions. Uh, Anand and others, in the first part of the book, try to look for the theoretical justification for both revolution and violence, uh, and problematize it. The last part of the book, actually is more ethnographic and uh, uh, is more tied to human lives and human experience and life stories, sometimes close to what you are calling subjectivity. Uh, I wouldn't say psychobiographical. It, it doesn't manage uh, that depth, uh, though I would argue that depth would be necessary uh, to understand what's going on why we participate, and there are, there are stories of 10-year-olds uh, joining the movement. Um, why would one join that movement as a 10-year-old? Uh, a joining a movement that comes stamped or stapled with the possibility of death, with the possibility of being killed. So we need exactly uh, a, 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 a more uh, intense and an intense or a depth understanding of why one would be there. Um, and there, I think, uh, the last chapter by Chandra and Karma does, they do very, very well, I would say, to pull us out resolutely, actually, uh, out of what they call the sandwich theory. The, the idea that the subaltern is sandwiched between the state and the Maoist movement. Thus, uh, not offering agency to the subaltern. They of course problematize what is agency. So it's not a simple uh, uh, reclaiming of agency in the chapter. It's a very interesting take on agency in the chapter. On the other hand, they also problematize the subaltern, especially the Adivasi subaltern, again staple to Birsa Munda history. The subaltern that is quintessentially, spontaneously, always already revolutionary. So from the Santal rebellion, we would draw. So either the subaltern is a victim, or the subaltern is a revolutionary. Um, and and uh, uh, in that sense, uh, why we need to think uh, the subaltern, and Ajay's work has been on this also, and this is one point both of us uh, uh, agree actually, why we need to think the subaltern beyond victim, revolutionary, beyond mere evil, which is also the way the Indian state sometimes uh, represents the subaltern, uh, the, the subaltern as evil, as, as tied to the Maoist movement, etc., etc., or sometimes utopia, tied to the subaltern, the subaltern who protects forests. So in that sense, evil, utopia, uh, victim, and revolutionary, all these four coordinates by which we have perhaps understood the subaltern 
sandwiched once again, which they call the sandwich theory, uh, between state and the Maoist movement perhaps needs to be revisited. The chapters in the book also in the process manage to revisit what is state, what is the Maoist movement. It is, it is a complex entity actually, it's not a, it's not, it's not a simple entity and, and neither the state is rock solid, hard, closed, homogeneous, nor is the Maoist movement homogeneous and closed. So in that sense it opens up. Uh, the book manages to open it up, open it up quite well. Uh, the question of democracy, um, uh, and 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 uh, uh, I, I I come to the second part in the book, um, which actually uh, connects in a very interesting way, which has uh, uh, Shumanta Das Shumanta Banerjee's chapter, Professor uh, uh, Shandoke's chapter, uh, which 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 tries to think through, on the one hand, uh, the deep textuality. Uh, I see in Anand's chapter, uh, and the kind of patient long term, uh, they have been there in Charkhan for nearly 10 years actually, uh, the patient long term ethnographic work uh, in Charkhan uh, 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 by, by some of the authors. Uh, uh, what democracy initiates is a complex process of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, Exclusion I need not take up. What I need to take up is inclusion. Inclusion of what? Inclusion of who? Are we not always already included? At least are we not included in the circuits of capital? Are we not always already included in the circuits of customary voting every five years? And in that sense, uh, 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 what is the relationship uh, between democracy and inclusion? And what is the relationship between democracy and exclusion? And what is the waiting lounge of democracy? Who is waiting to get included? Uh, and, and how is this operating? What the book manages to show is that one is always already included. There are NGOs, there are government schemes, there are government agencies, there are actors, uh, there are Maoist organizations laying claim to land rights. All kinds of processes are at work and inclusion is a continuous process. And it is, with inclusion, there is exclusion. So it's not a simple logic or a simple coordinate of inclusion and exclusion. Inclusion and exclusion are actually working in a very complex formulation over here, giving rise to what interesting phrase actually, uh, uh, when Ajay goes psychological, uh, he says the relationship between politics of hope and politics of anxiety. With despair as the middle terms. These are the three, three terms you invoke actually. Uh, very interesting, uh, the, the location of the subaltern between hope, despair and anxiety and, 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 and how to understand, understand that um, and uh, where this game, what he calls the game of inclusion exclusion is going on and the contingent contextual negotiations of the everyday uh, world and life of, the, of what the book calls the subaltern. The subaltern can also be problematized but I'm not getting into that. Uh, the other very interesting question, and I see this actually largely in Ajay's introduction, it is, I think, uh, an important uh, uh, question of problem he, he, he poses to democracy. Uh, quote, here I have to quote him, caste played the primary role of mediating the relations between the economy, polity, and social dynamics. In other words, the caste system absorbed and processed the matrix of violence between the various domains. Here, caste is class at a primitive, primordial level of production, a religious method of forming social consciousness in such a manner that the primary producer is deprived of his or her there was a continuous trade-off between culture and violence. And I think this is, 
this is a, a, a really interesting way to look at even culture, actually. Uh, Trade-off between culture and violence, violent regulation being outsourced by the state uh, to, as if, the question, question of caste and the way uh, the biopolitical of caste is organized or managed. And, and, and uh, uh, this is, this is uh, what he shows uh, to be uh, the coded or the secret work of violence within democracy. The way, the, the way democracy presents itself, uh, how, it, how it occults, how it covers, uh, veils uh, the violence of caste. Uh, so, so in that sense, you make an interesting connection between caste and class. Uh, and you also show through this how they are both encoded within what we call the democratic. And you cannot do them one by one or one after the other. Uh, they come in a mutual constitutivity within what we call the democratic. And, and uh, I think that is an interesting contribution of the book. The other question, and it relates to Ashish, that your point actually, uh, the question, uh, even I want to say this, uh, but one is, one is a little uh, uh, scared to say this now. The kind of distinction uh, Ajay invokes Gandhi, I would also invoke Tagore over here. The kind of distinction both um, uh, try to make between political transformation and social transformation. Uh, uh, political transformation uh, uh, organized in a certain way and social transformation um, that one needs to think uh, in a manner that could be different. And, and Tagore is very explicit uh, about it in, in the nationalism piece. Uh, and and uh, uh, how would we then think the relationship between the political and the social? Because the book's uh, prefacing question is, what is the relationship between political violence and social transformation? Now, if we need to think political transformation and social transformation not as completely clubbed, conjoined, as a Siamese twin, and, and I think that is one reflection that comes from your uh, work also. Uh, I, I pull out, I pull out parts from your work uh, where uh, one needs to think of these two maybe uh, not as completely conjoined, not as conjoined things, uh, political and social transformation. And uh, do we then uh, have some resources to dig into to conceptualize revolution? is a question uh, the book can ask. Uh, I will uh, uh, end... Uh, can I take five minutes? Huh? I, will, I will end with um, uh, uh, a problem uh, which, which the book tries to handle, but it's not a, not a question that can be answered too quickly. And that can be discussed over here. Uh, uh, problem one, the violent consequences of imposing the most fragile part of Marx, the predictive Eurocentric scenario upon large parts of the globe not historically centered in Europe. Historical materials. To use it to understand Sejarkant. And that is one question I think revolutionary violence needs to ponder on. And that would be the that would be the one other way of problematizing uh, revolutionary uh, thought. That do we do we insert or impose the most fragile part of Marx actually, uh, uh, the way he tries to think of transition of societies. Uh, onto other parts of the globe, how much, how far, how, how, how would we do it? The, the other question is, um, uh, the other question is, how do we look at the Adivasi? And, and this is a question that is recurring in the book, all and all, uh, all through actually, in all the chapters actually. Um, uh, the Adivasi, and let me put it this way, who is now being made to retire into prehistory 
and onto museumized artifacts and vacate space for more spectacular forms of capitalocentric development. So the question is not development merely, but which development? And um, the Adivasi, as the necessary double of modern India, has now become targets of a double displacement. On the one hand, territorial displacement through primitive accumulation, etc., etc., and on the other, what I would call the everyday, everyday psychological displacement marked by the brown orientalist equation, not white orientalism. The brown orientalism of elite modern India. Tribal India today is what we were yesterday. And their tomorrow is not, nothing other than what we are today. So this is the structure now in which we are operating. So it's not just a simple question of state violence. There is deep epistemic violence over here because we have created a new brown orientalist equation and internal orientalism actually. Uh, so it's not white orientalism. Edward Said talks of the brown orientalist equation that tribal, tribal India is, is our past and its future is our present. So we determine what is history there in central India, exactly where the Maoist movement is, is operating, is, is occurring. It also then uh, creates the Adivasi as a new figure of both lack and malignancy. The Adivasi lacks modernity, lacks capitalism. It's pre-capitalist. It has to come into my conduit of history, number one. Two, it is tattooed with death. It is tattooed with a death certificate. Its epitaph is always already written. It's already written that the Arivasi is as if a cancerous figure is going to die. And it's going to remain now in ghettos as we see in the United States now. So, so, so we have as if created uh, a history for it. And in this context, the question of, of the movement, of the participation of a 10-year-old in the movement, um, uh, uh, the, the, the question uh, of, of death and the question of violence become very important actually. How does one think death over here? Because, because the Adivasi is stamped, is tattooed with a death certificate now. Wonderful and, and, and how do we how do we deal with it? It is a question. And the book really tries to tries to uh, uh, look at it. Uh, the last uh, question uh, regarding um, democracy, um, I dip into uh, a paper by Sigmund Freud, a response to Albert Einstein, actually, a paper called Why War? And in that, Freud makes a somewhat crazy argument. He argues that we haven't moved from a regime of might to a regime of rights. We have actually moved from a regime of individual might, which is the might of, say, the tribal head, the tribal leader, to a regime of community might, majoritarian might. And this is, this is something one also needs to think about democracy. What is it? How is the community might, the secret of the community might coded in it? And India's developmental journey is a very interesting example. That is why I raised that question of the Adivasi's epitaph being always already written uh, uh, for, for, for the Indian developmental journey. And, and, and how do we respond to that? And is there a secret or, or coded community might at work within democracy? And, 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 and uh, does this lead to uh, a response? Uh, so it's not simply state violence. I mean, the point I'm trying to get at is that uh, uh, democracy as, as, the, as the coded language of community might uh, is also intolerable. And, and in that sense, um, uh, how does, and I leave you with this question, a question to which I don't have any answer, but it, but it troubles me, this question, actually. Uh, how does 
when we all want to live and live longer and prolong life, somebody walks on a path that is full of landmines. Landmines of a possible death, of a possible demise. What is the motivated irrationality of it? What is it that drives a person? A 10 year old, as Chitralekha shows, uh, who, who, who says bye to her saying, if I live, if I don't die, we'll meet again. And I think that's a chilling, chilling goodbye to a researcher, to an ethnographer, uh, by, a young, by a young adult who says, if I live, if I don't die, we'll meet again. What is it that drives this 10 year old, this subordinate, uh, uh, to, to reach this point? And, and, and how does one negotiate with death, not just revolution? And, and, and what is coded uh, uh, in, this, in this irrational and ultimate act of courage that, that I that I deny being killed, though I know I'll be killed in an encounter, that I deny being killed as if, as if I have al already uh, reached uh, death, even before the state reaches me. I've already coded it in my being, in, in what Ashisa was calling subjectivity, uh, that I've coded it in me. Uh, and you, and you can't as if kill me anymore because I have already appropriated death into, into my being. And that is a question to the Thank you. Thank you.